Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. We're going to get right to the show after these messages. Hi, this is Michelle Cox. I'm the author of the Henrietta and Inspector Howard series, and you're listening to Mysterious Goings On. You know, there's a question I've I've always wanted to know the answer to since uh, since uh, well since I had awareness I think you know because you always hear about you know the, the the man is always trying to keep you down you know what it's always the man's fault when something goes wrong well <laughs> I think today we're gonna find out a little bit more about this man because. We are lucky to have a returning guest, Lee Matthew Goldberg here. He's the author of the novels The Ancestor, which we discussed last November on the show. Please check out the link in the show note. The Mentor, The Desire Card, and Slow Down. He has been published in multiple languages and nominated for the Prix du Polar. He is first, his first YA series, Runaway Train, is forthcoming in 2021, along with the book we're going to discuss here in just a moment, a sci-fi novel called Orange City. Lee, welcome back to Mysterious Goings On. Hey, thanks so much for having me again. I, I had a blast doing it the last time. You know what? Uh, I, I haven't had a chance to tell you that, but, you know, um, your show scored some nice download action. Really? Awesome. I like yeah. hearing it. Cool. Very cool. Well, well, I, I found it fascinating I because, you know, I... I'm accused occasionally pouring syrup on my guests, but it's it's just I speak from my heart and the truth. I like the way your your, your prose works. I like the way how your books move. Um, awesome. I, from what I've, you know, I've, The Ancestor, and now, of course, Orange City, I like how you get a lot packed in, and, and you're not like, you know, you're not giving me a hernia like Stephen King with like a six, 700-page book. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I want people to get like in and out. It's like, <laughs> get the story, move it along, and then hopefully pick up another one of my books. And it also helps me release more books that way. Let's uh, go right into that now. You and I were chatting offline, and of course, I looked at your press kit when I got, you know, looked at everything. It's like, Jeez, Louise, wait a minute. He's like got like five books in the pipe or something like that. Yeah. Tell me about yeah. that. I actually I have four books coming out this year. So Orange City is the first and then the YA series, the first two books will be coming out. Um, and then I have a weird thriller coming out at the end of the year as well. A lot of it for me is like a backlog. So it's books that I have written that now are getting attention and getting, you know, deals and published. Um, so that's kind of happening right now. I still have about I honestly have about seven books that are like still in the backlog. Um, so yeah, it, <laughs> they're like, some things are ones that I've written, you know, 10 years ago and that I've kind of tooled with a little bit. Um, so it's exciting that now there's like attention and there's interest and I can publish them. I think that tree you sit under in Central Park is probably, you're probably going to, I don't know, they're going to either like put a plaque beside it someday or, yeah, or that but- or the park, park people are going to come after you and say, man, just, we need to let some grass grow here. Yeah, I was there yesterday, actually, and they were reseeding the area, and I got kicked out. <laughs> I hopped the fence, um, and I, I wasn't supposed to do that. But I hadn't seen it. It had been winter. You know, like it had been too long. Um, but honestly, they'll open it up in about a week, so I, I really can't that. Yeah. Isn't that funny how I just guessed that was probably yeah. what was happening? <laughs> I mean, New York City, it was like the first really beautiful day yesterday. It was like 60 and sunny. Like, I'm not going to not be able to work. I'm sorry. No, you got to do it. You got to. Now, folks, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go again, click the link in the show notes and listen to our first interview with Lee, because we talk about how he furiously scribbling in his notebook uh, under a, a tree in, in glorious Central Park, which, uh, yeah, we had our first really nice uh, couple of three or days about last week, and then we got hit with rain, but that's okay. We, it's, uh, you know, we got that taste. We know it's coming. It's okay. Yeah, I can wait. Yeah. I can, I, yeah. as the, the, the late, great Joe Cocker said, I can stand a little rain. Rain's not bad. Rain is good. You know, April showers, and it's going to happen. They do bring Mayflowers. And you know what Mayflowers bring, right? What do they bring? Oh. Furniture, because the Mayflower Moving Company, they bring your furniture. Ah, okay. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. A little wordplay with an author. You know, that's uh, that's why they pay me the big bucks. I was like a good little wordplay. (laughs) Let's talk about Orange City. Um, (laughs) I... Uh, this is the thing here. You know, a lot of people, and we know this is truly, a lot of people, especially when they go to a bookstore, which, by the way, I think that people will, 
I think reflexively after lockdowns are starting to end, yes. actually get off Amazon and go into a bookstore. Okay. And I think when somebody sees that it's a dy- Orange City is a dynamic mashup of 1984 meets Lost, Orange City is a lurid dystopian first book in a series that will continue with the explosive sequel Lemon World. Um, but you had a review. If you don't forgive me, Lee, I'm going to embarrass you. You yeah. had a review on Kirkus. I know you hate it when I read your good reviews. But, but I'm gonna just... <laughs> that was a really good one, so I'm totally fine with it. <laughs> yeah. He so Kirkus says neatly paced and escalating like a sinister bar crawl. Oh my God, I love that. The novel gives readers the flavor of Philip K. Dick and perhaps a little Kafka and J. G. Ballard in the mixology. We'll drink to that. Um, I'm glad he said Philip K. Dick because I got to tell you, that's that's where I went with this. Um, oh. I thought about it a little later, a little more, and I haven't written. By the way, I owe you a review. I know, I know you're waiting for my review, of course, my but review, you know, review, yeah. Um, but I, I thought, wow, you know, because the whole the whole conceit of this is this advertising exec. He drinks pow. He drinks this orange soda, and then he starts kind of figuring some things out about his reality and i thought well th- th- it could be a matrixy thing but but it yeah. really didn't occur to me it was more to me it was more in the pk dick uh, line it was just my vibe yeah i mean i read a lot of philip k dick and 100 percent all of that permeated in, into this book 1984 meets lost i don't know it was like when i was coming up i'm working i'm moving into like a screenwriting direction with my career mm-hmm. uh, one of my one of my books is is about to start into a very early stage in development and i'm working on the script as well um so i'm thinking in terms of like log lines so to me i was like well it's 19 for meets lost but then i'm like i don't know if that actually was the best <laughs> comparison because i think it really is more pk dick and the reviews that i've uh, that i've gotten has has been more you know like to android's dream of sheep and more along those lines it it re- it really is, it, but I know how hard that is with the with the blurbs. I mean, seriously. Um, I I had a, I have to tell you this real quick because the, by the way, folks, if you heard our last conversation, we we talk about his work and then we dip into the industry and then we go back and forth here. So I just was gonna tell you. So I had a guest on previously, Australian guy who's just killing it down there with his books, and uh, he wrote me a nice note after he was on the show, and then he said, "I'm sorry, folks, if you heard me, I did repeat this story once already in a different episode, but this is I want I want Lee to hear this." But so he said, he said, "Hey man, I checked out your books. Looks interesting, but your 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 descriptions are are terrible." <laughs> 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 it's the hardest it's like harder to write sometimes in the book itself because you're condensing i think rnc is about 300 pages into a paragraph i mean it's not it's not easy you know for somebody that's not naturally a copywriter so you're trying to just grab it like all these like kind of you know cool phrases and things like that to get people to you know pick up the book and and buy it from you well, yeah, and I told him, I, I, I kind of said back to him, I said, well, that's just like trying to say some, you know, just one nice thing about your children, you know, you, you just, you <laughs> yeah. know, but, but it's true. And yeah, it's very hard for me to do that. But anyway, he, he gave me, long story short, he gave me some free advice and he actually kind of gave me an example and he wrote up one for me. And, and uh, I, I, I mentioned this again, I was, uh, Michelle Cox, another author, she's Chicago based, told her about it. And actually, uh, about a month later, I saw an uptick and Maybe I owe him. Uh, I owe him some money. I don't know. Don't tell him, okay? You know, maybe just like an IOU for the future. Yeah, there you go. You know, I like IOUs for the future. I think that's important. And uh, so um, this, uh, so the, the 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 this this is going to be a series. When you sat down with this, did you have a series in mind for Orange City going forward, or was it I just going to get this story out and see how I feel? Yeah, so the the genesis of Orange City is very weird in comparison to my other books. It was a short story I wrote in college. I'm 40, so it was half of my life ago when I wrote a short story, and it was just about an advertising executive addicted to soda. There was no man or there was no science fiction, and I would like I just kept picking at it over the years. It was a screenplay, it was a book, and with each successive um, like iteration of it, it became more and more science fictiony until you know what's in front of you right now um so it's had this kind of really weird odd journey um but then when i began thinking of it kind of bigger i was like well it's bigger than just one book like it 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 really deserves sort of the second one you don't really get into the outside world too much in the first book so the second one while it would take place in a different city it then would move into the outside world um so it would hopefully kind of you know give a full kind of overview of of this whole world that i've created rather than just a little piece of it 
So are you? Uh, maybe you said that I don't. But are you? Are you pretty well sure how how many books we're going to get into this thing yet? I think it's going to be two. So what's interesting about this book is I own all the rights to it from my publisher, so I could resell it, and that was sort of the uh, I don't know, like the whole deal that happened with it. I, I'm trying something new out with it, basically. So we're going to try going out with it to like a tour or a bigger publisher. Obviously, mm -hmm. if they're interested, as many books as they want. You know, like I'll keep writing them forever. Um, if not, it's just going to be a two books. You know, like I'm. Oh, just best. two. Oh, okay. Here's yeah. one. Here's series. I always think is is two a series, but I guess it is. It's it's more than one. So what potentially could happen is Lemon World would be like a 500 page book, and I'd split it in two. So that that may be. It, it, I have some ideas. I haven't started it yet, um, so I have no idea. It's like <laughs> I don't know. I'm usually really good, and I'll finish a project and start a new one. And I'm just lacking like inspiration right now. I mean, it's COVID related. It's 100. percent You know, like life is just yeah. kind of boring and the same. So it's like I need to travel a little. I just need to re like reboot myself before I like start a project like that. You know? I understand. And, uh, you know, I probably intimated this to you in our previous conversation um, with my series. I'm, I've been stuck in the rut for this this eighth book in mine that is probably my last for this series. And so if since I've set myself for, up for this as my last with this one, because I, I feel like it's like a stopper in a bottle and I've just got to get it out so I can get this thing yeah. done and move on to other yeah. things I want to yeah. write. I'm yeah. just I'm yeah. very one track minded, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I, I've had all this fuzzy problem. But I was going to relate to you, though, that the good news is um, I th I think it's because uh, vaccines got rolled out um, and in our area, the, the, the sun came out. I just, I felt a shift. I felt hope. And then I felt yeah, like, yeah. damn man, get busy. And I've written like 10,000 words in the past month now. For me, that's a lot. Wow, awesome. That's great. Yeah. I, yeah. I, it's like, I was reversed. It was like, I was so prolific during all of this last year because I was just stuck in my apartment. Um, so like now it's like, I got my first vaccine shot. The sun is out. It's like, I kind of don't want to write. It's like, I want to like live a little bit. Um, yeah. so I think this like, I don't know, converse kind of experience. Then I know a lot of other writers that weren't able to like put a word down this entire yeah. year. Um, and, and I didn't have that case. So it's like hitting me now for whatever reason. I don't know. Well, you've got well, you got money in the bank, so to speak. You you had all this work during it, so you go out and live a little. I mean, come on, man! And yeah. you live in the greatest city in the world, for God's sake, get out there! Yeah. Well, I'm waiting for my second. I have my second shot in a week and a half, so like, yeah, before I go crazy. <laughs> That's fantastic. That is fantastic. Yeah, I'm very close on getting all 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 taken care of myself, which is great, and my family is too. So I'm, it's it's a huge blessing. Lee, let's 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 talk a little bit more about this though. Um, and then I'd like to get into some. Uh, I I kind of want to continue another con the conversation we had last time a little bit about uh, talk about screenwriting and things like that. But first, because mm -hmm. um, you you already told us that you know Orange City really wasn't this 20 years ago it was it was something else guy addicted to soda but now you've turned in what uh, what's the trials and tribulations uh, pitfalls etc or rewards of going from what you've been writing to sci-fi yeah i mean it it's like it's like a double-edged sword i love about sci-fi is you could kind of make anything up and completely create this whole own your own world but it's by far the hardest genre to write bar none. I could bang out a thriller in two months. There's no way I could do that with a sci-fi novel. Hence it taking me 20 years to write this. <laughs> um, and it's because you have to create this whole new believable world. You know, Arn True. City, it, it takes place in the future. It may be this world. It may not be this world. It, it doesn't really specify, but it's this whole other creation. So making that believable. And I'm, I'm amazed by some sci-fi writers that also could just bang them out so fast. I, I don't know how they do that. I mean, I'm completely in awe. And my interest in sci-fi has gotten bigger over the last few years, too. So like, I've seen a lot more sci-fi films, I've read a lot more sci-fi books. Um, so it, it, it's just this genre that I felt I wanted to try, basically. And I feel like as a writer, these days, you know, it, it's kind of a shame, because I feel like a lot of publishers, they're like, you're a thriller writer. And like, that's what you're gonna do. And like, F you for trying anything else. And I'm right. kind of like, no, like I'm young. I want to write as many types of things as I want to write. And if it doesn't work, then don't publish it. I mean, I, I don't, you know, but if it's good, then like I could find a whole new audience. Um, and hopefully I'm finding a new sci-fi audience as well. 
Tell me about the man, though. I got this whole this yeah. whole Doc Ock thing here. <laughs> tell us about the man. I'm very. I think you need to, if you can, tell us a little bit about him because I think he is. If people aren't interested yet, tell us a little bit about the man and why this is a, a pull to Orange City. Yeah. So the 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 premise of the city is it's basically um, like a haven for people who are either outcasts or a reform for people who have. Um, potentially being going to jail. So the city kind of removes whatever crap you went through in your former life and you could start anew. But the problem is you're locked into the city forever. Um, and the man is the ruler of the city. He's basically the dictator of the city. He lives in a giant eye tower that's shaped like an eye and he just watches his citizens obsessively. And he's crazy. He, he has all these limbs shaped onto his body because he wants to look like an evil arachnid spider um and really just kind of put fear in the minds of his citizens but also because it's he's obsessed with it as well um my idea for him came from it was a little bit slender man so because the man is like super 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 skinny um and, and there's like a creepiness the, there was a movie with christian bell to the machinist um where he like loses like all this weight and he just had this very like Ugh. creepy form to him um but also um i love francis bacon the painter um, and I went to, I feel like it was maybe at the Guggenheim. I went to a Francis Bacon um, exhibition and so many of his um, paintings that these like such weird, creepy kind of forms of people. Um, so the man kind of came out of that. He, he was kind of like a Francis Bacon nightmare. To me, I, I also just get, couldn't help but think since he was the, the eye and the ruler that all these limbs were, meant that he, you know, had his he, he had a hand on on all the levers of power because he had yeah. all of these different yeah yeah i mean it's his way of control too so like if you misbehave in the city you get sent to the empty zones just these kind of barren wastelands and they feed you these pills that make your limbs fall off and he just kind of collects them <laughs> so the you know you find that it's a little bit of a spoiler but you know you find that out later in the book um so it's a way of him controlling the citizens you know literally like he takes their limbs from them and he uses it as like a way to like, you know, oppress them and keep his thumb over them, basically, because I mean, you want to keep your limbs like, you know, so you want to behave so you can do that. Um, and he also has an obsession with eyes too. like he collects his secretary's eyes and then he sews them, he like zippers them shut. You know, he's just he, he, he's yeah. just a crazy person. You know, <laughs> like somebody <laughs> else said to me, like um, they, <laughs> Jared Kushner reminded them of the man like, <laughs> yeah, sure. absolutely yeah yeah i don't know if it was influenced but like absolutely it's jared <laughs> we are always always i say that we've spoken twice but we're, we seem to be on the same level so many times because i was getting ready to ask you would there have been somebody who used to be in the white house who maybe was something of an inspiration here not not just but not just trump but like you said because because jared really did have that slender man thing going on you yeah, know. yeah. There also were these ads all over um, New York City that was like looking for Slender Man, and it was a picture of um, Jared Kushner, and it was like dead in the eyes, and like you know, married to Ivanka. It, it was like making fun of him. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the the book. I mean, it, it's twofold because I started it so long ago. Obviously, I was not thinking about Trump when I first began right. it. But I mean, the book is called Orange City, like. <laughs> no. I think it's more of a coincidence, but these past garbage four years that we've been through, sorry for any of your listeners who are MAGA. <laughs> I highly doubt it, but Well, they're both they're both turning it off right now. Both of them. Okay. So people <laughs> buy, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean the, these last four years and the idea of what came off as a dictator completely, you know, by osmosis you know went into orange city so like the man is not trump but like there's aspects of him that definitely i've, I've put in that and it's almost like weird now because you know we're moving away from that error and it's like i don't want to give him any credence i yeah. don't want to speak of him i don't want to talk about him so it's interesting when people are like oh orange city and i'm like yeah yes he's orange but also like orange is a great color it's a really good fruit like let's take back orange from this 
garbage person that like took it from us kind of um and you know i don't know we are in cities the start of that <laughs> i love that no and and i i did not for a moment presume that it was that on the nose that you picked you know but it just did seem to work out that way and um, then when you tell us it's really yeah it's a fun bonus that goes in the book but i will say um i've had a few right-wing reviews of the book of oh. somebody who's right-wing who i think it's it's almost like what they're able to do very well, where like no matter what, it works for them. Like they could fit their own kind of, you know, hypocrisy into anything. So and 1984 sometimes is very misread as almost like pro right wing, you know, yeah, anti big brother and, you know, and anti tech. So like I've had a few reviews that have like, you know, almost like the that was the intention of the book you know, that, that it was that. And I'm like, on the same time, I'm not going to tell anybody how they should read a book. You know, I, 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 I am a fan of free speech and like that a part of books too. What I don't like is how they they're using free speech as like the, the thing they're hanging on now, you know, that like, that's the tenant of right wing. It's like free speech. Um, so that was the, the one or two reviews that I got connected to that, which was weird, you know, but interesting at the same time. Well, you, yeah, you see it just not to belabor it, but we, you do see it. I happen to think that, and I'm not the only one who thinks this, obviously, but that, that a lot of people are conflating liberty and, and free expression. Um, um, they're, they're, they're equating that um, with their rights, and they have a right to it, but they don't have a right to uh they're 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 confusing freedom and liberty with selfishness i guess is where i'm going yes yeah or like being an asshole you know it's like you have the right to be one but like should you be one no so you know and, and that's what they're like connecting to you know it, it, it's very bizarre right now it's we're, we're in very bizarre times well but i you know you make a great point just one last point on this is just that you know social media for example where people you definitely are free to be assholes but the point being uh if social media is supposed to be a projection of the common wheel of our society and it's online where you it's a public square it's an agora yeah. it's all these things okay great everybody's sitting around having a nice cup of tea in the square there's a fountain going off there's children playing there's pigeons everywhere and then some asshole comes in swinging a chainsaw well um guess what you're out. You don't get to be in the public square, yeah, right? Yeah, abs absolutely. So it, it, that's a perfect analogy. So it's like, why should they be allowed, you know, to just spew their hate any, anywhere? It, you know, it was the same thing when, like, that idiot Josh Hawley, um, his book was Ugh. denied by Simon & Schuster. And people were like, My that senator. My senator. Street. You know that, right? Oh, really? Really? Missouri. Oh, well. Um, I'm sorry. I it's not my fault. I promise. No, it's not you. It's not you. You know, it, 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 it's a product of just unfortunate circumstance. Um, yeah. But people were like, you know, that's against free speech, and it's like, no, Simon Schuster is a public company. They have absolutely every right to be like, I do not want that person representing us. Full stop. Like that's the end of the discussion. Yeah. Anybody else could publish them if they want. Nobody's saying that. You know. But it doesn't have to be from Simon Schuster, who would be paying him like a million dollars to do it. Like it's just it, it, it's a moot point. Well, it is, and it's just, again, you know, they want it both ways. Uh, now, this this bakery is allowed to not put uh, bake a gay cake for a gay wedding, but mm -hmm. Simon Schuster's not allowed to say we right. don't want that. So, which way is it? It's it's whatever works for you know them unfortunately, and th and that's just how it is. They're able to you know they viewed the world through a very thin lens the whole time so that's just how they're going to continue to view it and they'll argue against like the example you gave but they'll make us think about simon you know it, it, it's it almost is like you're damned if you do with them it's like there's nothing there's nothing you can do yeah there's nothing well there is something we can do we can shift gears for a little bit here now talk about um you've got some great irons in the fire with mm -hmm. with hollywood and with screenwriting mm -hmm. give us a little taste what's going on with that Sure. So I can't really say too much or be specific about anything because I'm signing some like clauses. Um, but one of my books it, for a very long time has been up and down in terms of, you know, development. Um, and what had happened was somebody else wrote a really garbage screenplay of it and it killed the project. <clears throat> and then my philosophy was like, oh, I'm going to learn from this. I'm just going to write this, all the screenplays to my books and see what happens. Um, and then we finally got some movement with it um, through that. So 
we're still hammering out some stuff um, and um, the screenplay would still be really needed to be worked on before, um, you know, it, it, it has real potential potential, um, but it's a good start and I'm really excited about it. Um, and it's really going to be my first taste of like full Hollywood, not like, you know, something doing well on like the blacklist and then nothing happening. Like it's an actual taste of it. Um, so we'll see. And hopefully it'll open up a lot of my projects because um, I'm working on all of them in different ways um, uh, as either like, you know, film scripts or um, TV projects. So if it's in, it's basically been in development hell and you rescued it with a, yes. okay. So if, if, it, how do you do, does that a, a situation where, and it, you, it, you can just speak, um, sure. uh, you know, f you know, metaphoric or not metaphoric, yeah. you can just speak, you know, uh, Whoa, somebody. Yeah, uh, sorry. I just I don't know if you heard that, but apparently the loudest motorcycle in the world just went by our studios. Um, I mean, you're sad to hear anything. It's like it's always. <laughs> <laughs> so do you do you build that into a contract or when they when they want to option you like, OK, I get first pass at the screenplay. Is that something you can do or do you? Yeah. So with this one, it was it, it, it was it would be option from the book, but also from my script so it's like a twofold kind of thing oh. not even quite an option yet it, 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 it's like the preliminary before an option almost um and then they shop it basically um and that's about the most i could say you know in, gotcha. in terms of it um but i think for all writers out there um you know who better if if you have the capabilities and you want to try screenwriting um who knows your project better than yourself basically you've written the book yeah. Um, and these days too, like Hollywood is so foaming at the mouth. Novelists all of a sudden were like unicorns. We're like, oh my God, like you could write like a full, you know, an eight series book. Like it just lends itself to becoming a TV show completely. And it's like all the plots are already there for them to sort of work with. So right. novelists, there's like been this shift where we're in more demand in Hollywood. It's all about just finding the right connections and 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 making it happen. And a lot of times, you know, it's it's just right place, right time, kind of. Yeah, definitely. I that's I understand. And you know, I uh, one reason I kept my series going too is because we spoke about this last time. Is um, novelists are unicorns because typically if they've written a series well one that's that they can you can bible that out and that's very appealing to netflix and stuff like that who want a lot of content and they want to know where it's going right they right you write one book that's great can we chop that up and make a series a limited series that's wonderful but if you've got five books mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. wow there it is right so um so that makes novels appear more appealing i think and Lee, you're not the only author who recently have discussed this with me on the show, and and it seems to be everybody's like doing what you're doing, but frankly, not as prolifically and not as well as I can see yet, because you've got such a, a huge amount of stuff out there that's available, yeah. um, right? And and that's been your strategy for a while now, right? Yeah, I it's it's like twofold. I think of it just like throw everything at the wall, and also I tell my agent this sometimes. It's like let's do just in like a basketball analogy like let's just do a full court press so like it's almost like not letting somebody say no because it's like you don't like this here's this what about this here's this you know like you're just bombarding people and slowly building those relationships as well um but what i found with with hollywood it's really finding the right relationships because it, you know if you don't projects could just kind of languish forever um, and, and, that, and that's kind of what happened with mine before, like people were attached, there were no real contracts, so there was no real investment. And then when there was less of an interest, you know, like, and also I was not spoken to at all in that whole process, you know, like, I, oh, wow, you don't exist, basically. So having it, it be my screenplay, it's like I exhibit a little more control over the process, too. And, you know, also, in all likelihood, when you sell a book, the highest you're getting is 2.5% off of potentially the budget. So if it's a low budget film, you're getting not much. If it's a high budget film, you potentially get a lot, um, but that's it. You know, you, where screenplay, you can maybe get into more like back end and like things like that. So to me, it's just a, a smart strategy and one I'm, I'm just gonna keep doing. And I like writing scripts in between books as well. They're nice like palate cleansers almost. It, it just shifts my thinking because the book is harder. It's a lot. It's a lot. You're more invested in, in the novel, I think. I, mean, I might have asked you this last time. Just, yeah. just curious aside. Have you? Do you use? Um, do you use a program? 
screenwriting program on your computer? Yeah, Final Draft, absolutely. Yeah, I, okay. you kind of have to, or it would just take you forever. And then if you were sending it, it, it would the the formatting would be kind of off. Final Draft's great. I think it's about two hundred bucks. Um, and it, it, I, I I don't really know of any other one. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, with books, I use I'm old school. I use Word. I, I have I've tried Scrivener, but it it. it not for me yeah i tried scrivener too and it it, it frustrated me more than anything else it just like seemed like there was flex. yeah it's like it's i don't like need doing too much work yeah then yeah it... did it actually i'm trying i forget lee did yeah. it offer like a screenwriting uh option on that i don't remember but if they I did it's it not the really... optional of it yeah i think it does now i mean yeah final draft is just set up so well um and i mean all when you send out stuff you 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 usually just turn it to pdf anyway so like you really could use any screenwriting software um if, if there's like a cheaper one out there um but yeah it, everything is it's just like seamless and simple and um i've been using it for years and years and years the trick is they make you buy the new one every time so it's you know it's a little bit of a racket Oh, so it's like an annual subscription? Is that what it is? Almost like every, every time I get a new um, laptop, which is often, you have to get a new final draft along with it. So it's eh, like... A couple hundred bucks. That's not too bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, they're all little rackets, Yeah. Well, yeah, what is it, right? It's a, I think I think uh, Scott Galloway from NYU Stern, he calls them a rundles where it's just, you know, it's a it's a constant subscription model. That's how you make money. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me let me ask you this, though. Uh, so have you been to an actual Hollywood pitch meeting yet? Boy, they I've hand you the bottle of water and the whole thing. Yeah, I so early on in my career, um, I, I I entered into a lot of competitions um, so the one I, I kind of went the furthest in was, um, script pipeline. Um, and they have all these other ones, book pipeline, um, and, uh, a bunch of other ones. So I got to know those guys really well. So for a, a pilot, a few years ago, I was invited out to Hollywood to, you know, you go in a room and like a giant room, like an auditorium, um, and you pitch to like 20 people. And I was wow. so nervous. And I had this, like, like to a T memorized pitch. Um, and what I learned is like now, you know, where it was like, hi, my name is Lee Matthew Gover. I have a pilot, you know, it, 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 it just sounded so rehearsed. So I've learned now it's more like fluid a little bit. And in all honesty, these days, it's, it's changing a lot. That's a very old school model. The best way now is, is if you work with like a graphic designer um, and you like, kind of draw the pilot a little bit. So you have your Bible, but there's like graphics connected to it. And then that helps them see it visually. If you're able to do that, that's that's these days what I think people are looking for the most, even if you're not like a giant production company that could be like, you know, here you go, you know, Scott Rudin, you know, like if you're outside of that and you're really just starting out and you have a graphic design friend, you know, I'm that's better. i didn't know see now i've heard of putting together like a sizzle reel you know like a book yeah. trailer yeah is that passe yeah. now or or yeah i mean it's kind of it, it's sort of like that um you know it's like within your bible instead of just being like like here's a, the characters written out it's like here's an image of that character you know here's images connect like i have i've been working on a cult show and, and books for a long time they haven't been published or sold or, or any way shape or form so I'm working, I, I kind of put it aside, but when I'll do the pitch for that, all of these images that I found in the public domain of like weird cult stuff to include that in the Bible itself so that they have some type, type of visual thing, I think is even better than you just speaking about it for 20 minutes these days. Like that's wow. a very like, I, I feel like, you know, becoming a little bit outdated. Like I know somebody who who had a movie that came out and and it was off of their script and it was because they worked with a, a graphic designer that did the pitch with them basically. Um, so I wish I could go back in the time machine and learn how to draw. That would have really helped. Like, oh, yeah, I mean, would stick man be okay? Would that, no? I mean, depending on the project, you know, the, you know <laughs> like, like, it might work for like a certain type of project. Um, oh my yeah, God. I mean, I would say like invest in the good designer if 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 you're going that route. Um, yeah, I, I think helps, and it's because it, Hollywood's becoming younger and younger. So like, yeah, some very visual. In their 60s and 70s who are running stuff, you know, now the people acquiring are 30, you know, and they grew up visually. So I think it's just shifted along with you know natural things shifting. 
you know, you know, at the end of like uh, the Mandalorian, I don't know if you've ever watched it, but yeah, they, oh, they have this. Yes. Yes. Right. That, exactly. Yes. Like that 100% that, that, that's what it would be. It was like a beautiful, you know, and those could be a painting in somebody's house. Like they're well yeah. really done. And it's interesting. Maybe those were, er, you know, there were earlier drafts of that, that John Favreau created to sell that show. I mean, who knows? So those could so really, if you're, if you're, you tell me, but so maybe just get the, the major story beats. Mm hmm which of course would include the pictures of your main characters and you could yeah that, that way you don't break the bank trying to do you know 50 pictures you know you do like a dozen or something for the major story beats would that work i mean think about for something like orange city for me to describe okay. a man i'm like he's like slender man i was influenced by francis bacon he has a million different arms and shapes i'm describing him but it's taking a while as opposed to right. like what if somebody just drew a picture of that and it was like here he is and they're like oh that looks really looks, appealing for a it's show. Jared Kushner with extra arms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, I could really, really see that. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's the, mo I, I think at worst it could never hurt. So like right. if you have the capabilities and you add it to your pitch, um, you know, I, I think, and yeah, I mean, kind of thinking of it like sizzle reel a little bit. There's a, there's a better word for it that I, um, is escaping me that they, that I think it's actually called that. I don't know why yeah. I can't. That, I'll I'll dig into it. You, I have just as usual. I've learned something really cool from you. Thank you. Um, okay, guys. So it was we're sadly got to wrap up. I don't want to keep you. I know you've got like uh, another book to write this afternoon. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, let me get what's what's next now. I know I know about the sequel to Orange City's coming up, uh, Lemon World. But uh, yeah. anything else we need to know about? Yeah. So I'm really really excited. Um, my first young adult series is coming out, um, and the first book will be out April 29th. So really really soon. <laughs> Um, and it's called Runaway Train, and it's about a grunge girl in the 90s. It starts off very sad. Her, her sister dies of a brain aneurysm, and she kind of just loses herself. Um, so she runs away um, to do all the items on her bucket list that her sister never potentially was oh, able wow. to do. Um, but it's set to a, a, a grunge soundtrack. So each chapter is like a different song on the mixtape she would give to her sister um and oh, that's it, fantastic thank you thank you i'm really really proud of this one um and it culminates with her trying to meet her idol kurt cobain um so her her goal is to get to seattle and um push courtney love aside and 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 meet kurt cobain for her for herself and like fall in love with him um and in the process she's she wants to be a singer too so she kind of finds her voice during it so it's very sweet it's very different from anything else um I, i've written um but she's really sarcastic and funny so like she's kind of like a 16 year old girl version of myself <laughs> <laughs> you know you know uh, you contain multitudes you really do man this is very Thank impressive you. um and soul first... asylum allowed us to use the rights in the book so i was getting what does this mind meld? I was getting ready to say, although I got to be honest with you, I know it's about Kurt Cobain coming, but I just keep hearing Soul Asylum here. So yeah, yeah. I mean, Nirvana, that would have been impossible to use. Yeah. It would be impossible to get those lyrics. Um, but yeah, I was in touch with, um, you know, it's like this whole complicated thing. It's like eight people own the rights and you have to get through all right. of it. But it honestly was very, very cheap in comparison to what I thought it was going to be. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it was great. I think and, a a lot of authors don't understand you can't just quote your favorite song like at the header of every chapter you could get nailed yeah. for that right oh yeah no you absolutely can't you could refer to a song so you could refer to the lyrics of a song so yeah. like she talks about the song violet by hole you know where she's like and the sky was full of amethysts but you can't literally quote it but the book opens with a quote from the song runaway train um, and it was really important for me to have that. Um, so it was worth it. I mean, it took about two months to like, you know, back and forth. Um, but it was a couple hundred bucks. It really wasn't, it really was That's, wasn't that's, bad. that's incredible. Well, yeah. I, I, I have done that. I, I have a running gag in my series where at one point or another, there is a Colin Hay, former lead singer of Men at yep. Work song, work, yeah. his solo stuff, right, is mm -hmm. playing or there's a song, but I don't quote the song, I just mention the song, right, or the oh, vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could absolutely yeah. just mention a song, you know, and because, like I said, the book, each chapter is, so like it opens with a Stone Temple Pilots song, um, but it just says the song. So the, the it's like chapter one, Dead and Bloated, Stone Temple Pilots, you know, chapter two. 
and so listen to the song in the chapter and each chapter kind of mirrors you know so like the first chapter is when she finds out her sister dies it's connected to the song you know so like it, it goes like that um but i had to be very careful and i just finished the sequel um and i was able to do it without kind of using it but there's a jesus and mary chain song at the end that i really want to try to get the rights of to, to use it so I, I i might try to reach out for that um it, 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 just because i feel like people might not know the lyrics and i think the lyrics would really kind of help shape the scene well, do you do you hit their manager up the management firm is that yes, where you go you, you do it twofold it's like i hit up soul asylum's manager who's who's really nice and and even was like i'll i'll send Dave Burner, some of the, I haven't heard since, and this was a few months ago, so I don't think he read it. Um, but he was like, oh, he'd be so happy to hear that you were inspired by the song, and, and I love that. Um, and then they put me in touch, because it was owned by both David Perner and a management company. So there's certain companies that deal with those management companies, um, and you contact them directly. And right. they, 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 it's like rights management. Um, right. You kind of just go back and forth and then you have to send them literally where it's taking place in the book. So they have to prove it. So it was the opening quote. And then in like chapter three, she like cranks her tunes and like is singing two lyrics from from Runaway Train in her car. Um, so they had to make sure that the scene was like a probably not like denigrating the song or, you know, right. using it in an uncomfortable way or anything. So, um, yeah, it, it took about two or three months, like a, a back and forth. Um, it, it was a lot. I wouldn't do it for unless like it really was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I tried to get, well, speaking of Colin, hey, I, I wanted to actually, but this was different. This is for broadcast. I wanted to use one of his songs, Looking for Jack, for a limited podcast series I was going to do. That's a whole different thing than just printing a few lyrics. That's it's huge. so much more expensive. It's like, it, it, it's so much more because they're literally hearing the song. So you're, you're paying for the song. You're not just paying for the lyrics. So I think you're dealing with like whole other rights management connected to it. Um, and I know it could be like thousands and thousands of dollars oh, yeah. you know, to yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. But, they, they basically just kind of laughed me out of the room. I was like, oh, never mind. Yeah. But what I've learned with lyrics is like, it's really, really cheap for the most part. It's mostly just a couple hundred bucks, unless it's like a Nirvana level, you know, like, and Nirvana, yeah. it's like the rights are so common. I mean, they're fighting over it, I think, still. Like, yeah. whether yeah. it's Grohl or Courtney Love, I, I don't even know where it is in that. So I don't even know who I would contact. But in the second book, um, there's a scene, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but there's a scene where she meets Courtney Love and it's a chapter of her and Courtney Love. Um, and I could just do that. I mean, I don't have to get the rights from anybody. Like, hmm. you know, yeah. And, and I researched exactly what Courtney Love was doing at that time. And she was yeah. on tour and I pictured her taking a night off and going to this club and meeting the, the, the narrator, at, you know, at that one time off. And it, it's a weird time because it's a few months after Kurt Cobain dies and it, it, it's a very strange, but also Hole was accelerating like crazy then too. They were blowing up. Yeah. You know? So it, it was such an interesting time. And I, 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 I watched this interview of her and Barbara Walters um, that was fascinating and that she really blamed herself for his passing because she was like in an argument with him right before and she was yelling at him. And she like took that to heart. And even Barbara Walters was like, you have to let that go. Like, it's not you, you know, it's very, very yeah. heartwarming. Um, not heartwarming, it was, it, was, it was very heartbreaking. Um, yeah. But um, I don't know, really cool to just also be able to bring it to life. You know, it's just a fun extra research thing. Well, it's fun to do that. I, I again, sorry to go back. I just, you're reminding me of something I did. So my third book though, I, since it was a running gag with Colin Hay, which is just funny in itself, he's a brilliant artist, but a lot of people yeah. are just like, really? Yeah. But uh, I, I love to, Oh I, yeah. I've got them all and I've met him twice. He's just really? a marvelous. Fe oh, he's a sweetheart. And, but I had it where my character who's an author. He was being interviewed on the today show and he runs into a guy in the green room before he goes on and he, he doesn't know he he he, he somebody says uh, he goes wait and he, my character says and then, and then the guy walks out you know colin hay walks out but i don't say it's colin hay and i describe him mm -hmm. and then he says to a a grip he says well, hey that was uh what he goes oh yeah phil collins yeah 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 so <laughs> you know 
Which is actually a story I heard uh, Colin tell at the Largo, oh, cool. you know, really? about how, you know, mistaken for Phil Collins a lot. Anyway, it's you know what? I, I'm, you know. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's the, it's part of that very similitude, and I love to have a little bit of winking, a little winking fun with my uh, with my my readers that way. Lee, I have, as usual, taken way too much of your time, but no, I I enjoy speaking with you so much. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and yeah, anytime, anytime, I'll come back. Well, uh, tell us before you run off and again, as I said, write a new novel this afternoon. Uh, tell us where people can find you. They'll be in the show notes, but go ahead and give us uh, give sure. us the word. Where do we find you and your books and everything? Yeah, so the best is probably um, you go to my website, LeeMatthewGoldberg.com. Um, you can find me on Twitter, um, Lee Matthew G, um, or you know Amazon, Bookshop, you know all, all, all those great places to buy books. And yeah, hopefully in the future, you know, to go into a bookstore and buy it. You know, you can go now. You can right. go into a bookstore now and buy a book. You could do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, just wear a mask. Whatever. Lee Matthew Goldberg. I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but you're the man. Thanks for being Thank with you. us here on Mysterious <laughs> Goings On again. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. Hey, folks, we're going to take a quick break in the episode. I probably mentioned here and there that I have another podcast called PR After Hours. PR After Hours is basically an after hours virtual lounge where public relations, marketing and general business professionals get together and have a laid back conversation about what they do and how we can help each other. It's great tips if you're running a business or if you're part of a PR or marketing team or you own your own business. I guarantee you'll learn a lot of stuff. It's a twice weekly show. We've been doing it for a year now. Very proud of it. And you can get it right here on Anchor FM or pretty much wherever you get quality podcasts. But if you want to learn more information about PR After Hours, please visit PRAfterHours.com. I hope you'll check it out. It's a little bit different vibe, obviously, than Mysterious Goings On, but also... I think you'll, you know, if you're not careful, you might learn something and have a laugh or two as well. Thanks so much. Again, that's PR After Hours on Anchor FM. Thanks so much for listening to Mysterious Goings On. Don't forget, we have a complete archive of all of our interviews, monologues, updates, live readings, dead readings. All of that stuff is available at MGOPod.com. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to us so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the usual suspects. Please join us there. Again, don't forget, MGOPod.com also has links where to find me on social media and how to get in touch in case you want to be a guest here on the show. Well, I think it's time that I move on for this week, but until next time, keep reading.